I'll be back in one minute. No problem. Mm -hmm. So I think we maybe just want to wait five more minutes to give the people a chance to connect and then I do some general introduction. Um, I think we're already recording, that's a bit early, but maybe I pause the okay. start the recording. That's fine. So hello everyone. Thank you for connecting. That's awesome that there are so many people and so many people who are interested in the topic and um, in the talk of Min uh, Tottenham. So, it's a great pleasure to welcome you today here. And, um, I will just give a short introduction about your bio, <laughs> if you want. Yes, I'm already starting the discussion. Um, so Nim Tottenham is a professor of psychology at Columbia University and is currently also in New York and uh, speaks to us from New York. Uh, she's the director of the Developmental Affective Neuroscience Laboratory and uh, examines brain development and emotional behavior in humans. Um, especially, um, she inter investigates the interplay between brain development and caregiving experience in humans. And that's also how I got to know your research or her research um, because to, of the link to attachment studies. Um, and um, her research has highlighted fundamental changes in brain circuitry across the development and uh, the role of the early experience, experience, experiences such as caregiving and stress. 
And that's, of course, uh, very interesting to a lot of us who are also investigating similar processes. Um, and she looks especially into the role of these circuitries, neurocircuitries. She has authored impressive amount of 100 25 journal articles and book chapters, is a frequent lecturer in both national and internationally um, um, events on human brain and emotional development. Um, she is a fellow of the Association for Psych Psychological Science and of the Society for Experimental Psychologists, and her scientific contributions have been recognized by the National Institute of Mental Health Brains Award, the American Psychological Association, the Sting News. Science Award for Early Career Contributions to Psychology, and most recently by the National Academy of Science Journal and Research Award and the Fritz Linda Speer Award. So very impressive and very happy to have you here. Um, and we are recording. Um, we agreed upon that kind of understanding questions could be asked during the talk if they're kind of short and everything that leads to a more broader discussion would probably be best uh, if it could be discussed at the 15 minutes that we have at the end of the talk. And with this, I would leave the, the stage up to you. <laughs> very happy to have you here and um, very much looking forward to your talk. Great, thank you so much, Hannah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to just get my screen shared here. Um, so yes, I'm very thankful to Hannah for this esteemed invitation and excited to share with this group uh, some of our research um, today. I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person, but I hope I get invited again in the future. Um, so our research addresses a very old question in psychology, which is really what is the link between our early experiences, whether they're adverse or nurturing, and our later emotional functioning? So thinking about things like emotional learning, reactivity, and regulation. And as you can appreciate, particularly in the case of the human, this link can last a long time, sometimes even a lifetime. Um, and so this begs the question, what is the glue that holds uh, these two endpoints together? And there are many different mechanisms that one could study. And the approach that we take is to study brain development as mediating this link. And because I'm interested in emotional uh, functioning, particularly emotion regulation, uh, this talk will be focusing on the development of the connections between the amygdala, which is this deep set of nuclei that are responsible for emotional attention and learning about the relative safety and danger of our environments, and uh, the strong bi-directional connections that the amygdala has with the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and because of the connectivity patterns and the cellular makeup of cells in the medial prefrontal cortex, this region of the brain is really well positioned to help coordinate and regulate potential over arousal of the amygdala. And our approach is to study this process during development. How is the system constructing itself? How is it taking in information from the psychosocial environment to produce individual differences in maturity? Now, of course, um, this neurobiology is not developing in isolation. It's developing in a very special environment, which is um, a species expected environment. Um, so the caregiver is playing a very important role in um, scaffolding the way that this neurobiology develops. And um, what, this is not only true for humans, this is of course true for many species, but humans enjoy some outlier status with regard to how long we spend in the care of our parents. So in many species, you know, they stay in a juvenile state for, um, you know, on the order of months. And in humans, uh, we're really talking on the order of years, um, decades. And what you can appreciate is that is a very bizarre design for a species um, because it is metabolically very expensive for a human to raise raise another human being for one or two decades. And so this begs the question, what's the trade-off? Why did mother nature design us this way? And one argument is that this long time that we spend with our parents affords us the luxury 
of a very long childhood, which translates into a very long period of brain plasticity where we can learn and gather sufficient information to develop a very sophisticated behavioral repertoire and maturity. And so we think about the caregiver as providing this scaffolding, like on a building that's being constructed for the central nervous system that um, supports this prolonged period of plasticity. Now, of course, um, oh, by the way, I should mention throughout this talk, whenever I'm referring to human caregivers, I'm referring to mothers, <clears throat> I'm referring to fathers, I'm referring to biological or adoptive parents, grandparents, whoever is the primary caregiver of the child, because that, um, that's pointing out that this is a learned relationship. This strong relationship is one that we learn over our early years. Now, when we think about brain plasticity, it is a um, metaphorical double-edged sword. <clears throat> and what, what I mean by that is on the one hand, this prolonged period of brain plasticity may increase our risk for mental illnesses that are associated with adverse environments. So um, many studies have shown that if this is age and years here on the x-axis, that a number of mental illnesses that are associated with difficulty in emotion regulation processes tend to show their peak age of clinical emergence in this transition between childhood into adolescence, which is a stark reminder that these are developmental disorders, all of them. On the other hand, this incredible period of plasticity of childhood is the basis of our epistemic growth, our ability to seek out and gather information from the environment is really manifest through our um, brain plasticity. Now, during our development, there's this very interesting balance that we achieve. On the one hand, we have this strong drive for epistemic growth and exploration and the risk-taking that's associated with it. But this drive is kept in check with our other strong drive, our other need for security and safety. And so, for example, this child here is able to explore his environment because of the presence of this species expected stimulus of his parent. So in other words, the parent is enabling efficacious exploration of the child by being a source of security um, for him. So it's for this reason that uh, people like Alan Srofe have argued that the caregiving relationship is an asset to the child and that it affords him or her the luxury of exploration and risk-taking. Now in maturity, our central nervous system plays a large role in ensuring our safe and independent exploration. And today I'm gonna to be focusing on the amygdala and its connections with the medial prefrontal cortex in their central role in mature emotion regulation behaviors. And the premise of my talk is that the caregiving relationship plays a central role in establishing the neurobiology of mature emotion regulation. Now, across many studies um, from our lab as well as others have shown that the amygdala seems to show this strong and early uh, functionality. So this is age here on the x-axis, and what studies often show is this robust response early in life um, that tends to attenuate at older ages. And that makes a lot of sense because when we're young and little and relatively new to this planet, we have a lot of learning to do about the safety and danger of our environments. So we want the amygdala functioning at a relatively early age. However, um, studies have also, also showed that um, this high amygdala functionality is occurring in the relative absence of adult-like connections with medial prefrontal cortex, which often don't emerge until um, sometime in adolescence. Given this uh, pattern of development, this makes this period of childhood particularly interesting to us as potentially being a biological substrate 
for sensitive periods of this neurobiology. In other words, might the nature of amygdala prefrontal function in childhood make it so that the environment has a particularly outsized impact on the way that the system ultimately constructs itself? So in other words, we've been very interested in this question of whether childhood is a sensitive period for the development of these connections between amygdala and medial PFC. So um, one can appreciate that investigating or identifying sensitive periods can present real challenges in a species like humans who take so long to grow up. So how does one test this um, in a species that takes at least two decades to reach maturity? Well, we were inspired by a uh, rodent study performed by uh, Takao Hench's lab at Harvard uh, that showed that stimuli that were presented or learned about in, let's just say, mouse childhood, so post-weaning, prepubertal age, stimuli learned during this time seemed to have some enduring and potent um, effects throughout life. So in this study, if you're not familiar with it, mice were placed in an open field. These are adult mice placed in an open field. And as many of you know, uh, mice will run to the corners of the field because the center is vulnerable. So in this study, he had two nests in the open field. One was silent and the other one played music. And uh, the typical adult mouse will av avoid the music nest, they'll approach the silent nest. However, if during their childhood period they were pre-exposed to music, then in adulthood they would start to gravitate towards the music nest. And the songs were, this preference was song specific. So if they were pre-exposed to Beethoven, then in adulthood, they would prefer Beethoven and not jazz or vice versa. So this learning is age specific. It doesn't occur at other ages. Not only is there a preference that emerges, but presentation of the childhood music seemed to decrease anxiety as measured by increased approaches to the center of the field. And the exposure of the childhood music, um, if the exposure happened during a sensitive period, then there was greater activity in medial prefrontal cortex, which is evidenced by um, greater CFOS activity, which are the green dots I'm showing you here. Music exposed um, at uh, outside of the sensitive period did not result in this increase in medial prefrontal cortex. So not only was medial prefrontal cortex increased in response to the childhood music, but also strengthening connectivity between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex. So we were inspired by this study because it music perhaps gave us an avenue to start investigating potential sensitive period activity in humans. So in other words, um, maybe not Beethoven and jazz, but maybe if we used pop music, um, where we have a little more confidence about how old you were when you were probably first exposed to certain songs, perhaps we can be better, more confident at targeting that sensitive period, that putative sensitive period in childhood, rather than um, those outside of this period. So the study approach worked like this. We brought in young adults in the year 2012, and we wanted a stimulus from someone's childhood. So in other words, when they were about seven years old. So um, we do the math. That means we need a stimulus from about 1997 for these young adults. So we searched through the archives and we found a stimulus that um, could help us here. And so, for example, the Backstreet Boys um, would be a really good stimulus. Songs from the Backstreet Boys would be a really good stimulus for us because the assumption is that you were first exposed to the Backstreet Boys at seven and definitely not before that, maybe less so after that. So to parallel the rodent study, we wanted to stress out our participants. Um, we didn't use an open field, but instead these were students at UCLA and we gave them hard SAT questions. SAT is like the college entrance exam. So we stood over their shoulders and watched them and we told them that they were doing pretty well, but a little bit below the average UCLA student. So they should try and improve their performance. 
This effectively stressed out the participants, and then we gave them rest periods. During those rest periods, we presented them with two radio stations. One would play songs by the Backstreet Boys, like Quit Playing Games With My Heart, and the other radio station would play songs from their adolescence. So for example, Justin Bieber and Ludacris. And just like in the rodent study, we assessed their behavioral preference for one set of songs versus the other. And what we found was, um, if you pay attention to the green bar, with increasing stressor presentations, participants were increasingly choosing to tune in to the radio station with their childhood songs. Um, this is a relative preference here, but if we just isolate to the people who said they listened to a lot of pop music when they were kids, then that becomes an absolute preference. Control individuals were not born in the US and reported not really listening to a lot of American pop music. So they were not choosing the childhood songs, they were instead choosing the songs like Justin Bieber that they at least were familiar with. Note that this preference here is not about liking. It's not about their musical taste. In fact, most people reported disliking um, the Backstreet Boys relative to Justin Bieber. Um, but nonetheless, under stress, under duress, participants seem to have this kind of gravitational pull towards the stimuli that they were exposed to during childhood. At the physiologic level, it was only the childhood songs that resulted in a significant decrease in auto, uh, autonomic nervous system arousal as measured by galvanic skin response. And subjectively, the more that people listened to or chose their childhood songs, the calmer they reported feeling during the stressor. And in a very small sample, size, we were able to scan some participants and we found that the childhood stimuli were more effective in increasing medial prefrontal cortex activity, strengthening that connectivity with the amygdala. And the more that medial PFC activated to the childhood songs, the less anxiety participants reported feeling. So these data were exciting to us because they started to hint at this idea that there really was something special about stimuli learn during this childhood period. But of course, we're not really interested in uh, the Backstreet Boys. We're interested in a more universal stimulus that is, uh, we're getting a lot of exposure at during a time coincident with this period of brain development, and that is the caregiver. So um, we turn to a very old quote by John Bowlby, who uh, established attachment theory, who said, in the countryside in springtime, there's no more familiar sight than mother animals with young. So familiar are these sights, and so much do we take it for granted that lamb and you will remain together, that the questions are rarely asked. First, what causes these animals to remain in each other's company? and what function is fulfilled by doing so. So I really love this quote because I love studying things that we take for granted. And um, I think like gravity, like sunlight, parents are something that's easy to take for granted and yet they have really powerful effects on our development. Now in um, some early work on the sensitive periods of affective behavior, it established that there's this very important sequence of developmental of events for different learning systems. Namely, there's this maturational delay between affiliative learning systems, you know, learning to approach something and our fear learning systems, learning to avoid some, uh, uh, stimuli. So for example, in this uh, study with puppies, uh, it was shown that if a puppy was first exposed to a human handler early in life, um, you would get affiliative behavior in the puppies. However, if that same exposure happened at an older age after this affiliative critical period or sensitive period, then fear behaviors emerged. Um, and uh, this idea of a staggered developmental sequence really makes sense for a species like dogs as well as humans 
who have to learn an affiliation to their caregivers for survival. So this order makes sense because fear systems will interfere with affiliation learning systems. And this is the affiliation systems are the critical systems um, necessary for attachments to form. Now this, uh, uh, right, so this learning uh, seems obligatory because it will occur even in the presence of shock. In fact, shock during this age will actually enhance affiliation learning, enhance approach learning. Um, and this type of behavior is the reason why Bowlby stated that early affiliative learning seems to defy the rules of reinforcement learning. More recently, Regina Sullivan at NYU, her group has replicated this effect in rat pups using a fear conditioning paradigm. So if you're not familiar with this work, simply she pairs a neutral odor, in this case, it's a peppermint odor, with a foot shock. Now, what she finds is uh, if we take an older young animal uh, and place that peppermint odor in a Y maze, this animal will do what you and I would do. It would avoid that peppermint odor because it had been paired with a foot, a foot shock. However, in a very young animal, they will show some pretty bizarre behavior. They will actually approach this peppermint odor. And that replicates that early affiliative learning predating that fear learning. Now, this same behavior has been shown to underlie learning of the mother's cues. I'm saying mother here because these are rats, but learning the parent's cues. In other words, this is the basis of attachment learning and the amygdala plays a large role in this type of learning. So now if we focus on these older animals who in the mother's absence are doing what you and I would do, they avoid the peppermint odor, that's what I'm showing here. They're avoiding the peppermint odor like you and I. However, if you now place them in the mother's presence during initial acquisition, these animals will now show that infantile affiliative behavior. They will start to approach that peppermint odor. And that's what's being shown here. So the mother's presence is switching their behavior, switching their fear learning from an avoidance to an attraction. And the amygdala is involved in this in the following way. Here's rat age on the x-axis. There's this period where amygdala function is critically dependent on the mother's presence. So when the mother is in the nest with the rat pup, she decreases court production, um, corti uh, cort cortisol in humans, corticosterone in, in rats. She decreases court production, which prevents amygdala from engaging during fear learning. So, initial, so essentially the amygdala is silenced. However, if the mother is away, she's out of the nest, those processes reverse, amygdala is free to participate in fear learning. And that's why you get the more mature amygdala-based avoidance learning that you and I would show. So in other words, the mother's physical presence is changing what neurobiology is participating in fear learning. And when she's present, she is buffering the activity of the amygdala silencing it during fear learning and therefore enabling alternative learning mechanisms to mediate learning and you get this seemingly bizarre related approach behavior. So this is an important process or it's uh, posited to be an important process for attachment learning, but it's also an important reminder that the developmental state of the young altricial brain is designed perfectly to coordinate with parental input. In other words, the young brain is not, and the immature brain is not simply a miniature or um, deficient adult brain, but it's actually perfectly designed to do what it's supposed to do at that developmental moment in, in time. So we were very keen on asking whether human uh, uh, learning is affected in a similar way by parental presence. So in collaboration with Sullivan's lab, we uh, tried to develop a human paradigm asking the same question. Um, and we brought in very young preschool age children, three, four and five year olds 
and we presented them with a, uh, a blue square. This was our CS plus, our condition stimulus, and it was paired with a co-terminating. Um, we didn't shock children, but instead we used a very aversive noise. It was like loud nails scraping down a chalkboard. Um, young children don't like this noise. Adults don't like this noise. So the blue square was paired with this aversive noise. The triangle was never paired with anything. Children learn this association either alone or they learned it with their parent present. The parent's not doing anything. They're just physically present in the room. Later, after acquisition, parents went away and we placed children into a human and Y maze, and we placed the CS plus on one arm and the um, CS minus on the other. We asked children to enter this, uh, this maze and pick a door to retrieve a prize. And we showed them, showed them that it was the same bucket of prizes behind both doors. We just wanted to see which door they preferred. So they did this five times. And what we saw was that when children conditioned alone, they did what you and I would do and what the rat pups when they conditioned alone did. They avoided that nasty blue square. However, if, if children conditioned in the presence of their parent, they did what those young rat pups did when their parents were present and they showed this seemingly bizarre approach related behavior towards the CS plus, which again, I keep saying is bizarre, but actually makes a lot of sense for the necessity of affiliation or attachment learning in an altricial species like a human. We were also interested in seeing if the amygdala in children were, was similarly modulated by parental cues. And so we performed um, an fMRI experiment. We did something very simple. We simply presented um, children pictures of their parents for 30 seconds and alternated that with pictures of somebody else's parent, a stranger for 30 seconds. And what we observed was that in childhood, parental pictures was associated with a decrease in amygdala reactivity, which we interpret as a parental buffering of amygdala reactivity, perhaps similar to what uh, has been observed in the rodents that we no longer see in adolescents. And that's not to say that parents aren't important during adolescence, they certainly are, but it may be at the level of the amygdala, parents have started to lose their efficacy. And presentation of the parental cues strengthen connectivity between the amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex. And one idea generated from these findings is that routine parental presence is part of the mechanism that over phasic and repeated uh, activate co-activation between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex may be the pathway through which these tracks lay down over time and give rise to more mature emotion regulation. Now, as effective as parents may be at buffering amygdala reactivity, um, these data all depend on the parent themselves being calm or not being distressed. If parents are distressed and dysregulated themselves, we know from a large clinical literature that parents can be very good potentiators of children's fear and stress. And so to model that, uh, we did a second experiment where instead of fear conditioning the children, we fear conditioned parents and videotaped the parents. So here, for example, is me. I'm getting fear conditioned to this pink circle. Every time I see the pink circle, I flinch and we're, that's videotaped. We show that videotape to, for example, my daughter. She'll watch me get fear conditioned and she'll watch somebody else's parent get fear conditioned to a diamond. So she herself is never fear conditioned. She's just watching other people get fear conditioned. And what we observed is uh, following acquisition, my daughter would show a greater amygdala rate response to the cue that I fear conditioned to relative to the cue that somebody else's parent conditioned. And while children 
could learn to dislike both cues. Higher scores means better learning. They can learn to dislike both cues, but they learn better to dislike the cue that their parent had conditioned to. Now, um, we not only scanned children while they were secondhand conditioned, we also then scanned par their parents during firsthand conditioning. And we observed this intergenerational correlation between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex, such that the parent with a very high amygdala response during their own conditioning had children who, de who exhibited decreased prefrontal cortex while observing their parents' condition and vice versa. So these data tentatively paint a picture whereby an intergenerational um, neurobiological association exists um, where parents may be indirectly buffering their, their children's amygdala reactivity during observational learning. Okay. In my last 10 or 15 minutes, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about a special population of children that we've been working with for about the past 20 years. And these are children who've had experiences of caregiving related early adversities. I'll be abbreviating this as CREES throughout this talk. We specify caregiving related. There are unfortunately many forms of adversity that children can be exposed to, but because we're interested in emotion regulation development, we are particularly interested in those experiences that disrupt the integrity of the parent-child bond. Now, um, in the first set of data that I sh I'll show you, these are data from children who experienced early institutional care, what we commonly call orphanages. Um, what that means is these are children who experienced abandonment or, or separation from their parent, their biological parents, and then uh, being raised in a kind of warehouse environment with no parents. And what we see is on average, there's an increased risk for amygdala to exhibit hyperactive uh, responses to stimuli like fear faces and atypical connectivity between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex. What does that atypical connectivity look like? Well, um, what we observed was it, it, it was, it was not what we expected, um, I'll say that. So unlike a comparison group of children who did not experience crease or early adversity, um, who show this childlike connectivity uh, between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex that switches to a more adult-like pattern in adolescence. Children with the history of Crees showed what looked like a more adult-like pattern even during childhood from four to nine years old. So these data um, got us looking at a lot of the rodent literature which showed that actually this is probably what we should have expected because there are, uh, there's a lot of evidence of this stress acceleration in neurobiology associated with fear learning. And I list here just a, a short but growing list of phenotypes, both behavioral and neurobiological associated with or reminiscent of this acceleration. And um, that these data give rise to the notion that sensitive periods, which is a period of heightened brain plasticity, sensitive periods themselves are plastic, meaning this is a very nice review paper by Janet Worker and Takao Hench, but meaning that um, the moments in development when the brain is particularly plastic may uh, delay or accelerate their onset. And uh, one hypothesis is that caregiving adversity may lead to this accelerated or more precocious sensitive period for fear neurobiology. And so the idea is that if this is age on the x-axis and we typically see amygdala medial prefrontal cortex um, connectivity emerging during adolescence sometime, perhaps amygdala hyperactivity 
induced by very stressful environments for a human infant may lead to the earlier instantiation of these con connections uh, with cortical regions. Now, one idea that we have is this is an adaptation. This actually serves some immediate benefit for the individual in meeting their um, needs at the moment. However, this may also co-occur or produce a reduction in developmental plasticity. So to further test that question, um, we uh, asked whether uh, accelerated development following Cree's may place limits on parental buffering of the amygdala. So we repeated that parent stranger fMRI paradigm. And what we observed, these are the data I showed you earlier, where children with a typical caregiving history showed reduced amygdala reactivity to their parents. Following Cree's, we did not see that decrease in amygdala reactivity. Um, consistent with the idea that there might be a truncation in this childlike uh, brain pattern. However, what uh, the astute observer is looking at is these are very large error bars. And so what that suggests is there are individual differences here. There are some children who are going to show amygdala buffering and those who aren't. Um, even uh, with the same early experiences of Cree's. So we interrogated those individual differences longitudinally. And if you pay attention to the right side of the screen here, what we're showing is we split uh, children into those groups that showed buffering of the amygdala at time one and those who didn't. Um, and we're plotting their anxiety. So at time one, these two groups did not differ in anxiety and they're both uh, higher in anxiety than children without the Cree's history. But over time, if children showed buffering of the amygdala at time one, they also showed significant decreases in their anxiety over a two year period, so much so that there was no statistical difference between them and the comparison group whereas the children who did not show buffering at time one maintained those high uh, uh, anxiety levels. Now, what differed between those two groups? In, uh, in our data, it was the difference was their reported attachment security with their parents. So children who showed buffering of the amygdala at time one were also those who reported a stronger attachment relationship with their parents. Um, now, obviously, we cannot say anything about directionality here, but the data are consistent with um, other findings from our lab, as well as others, uh, showing the importance of family relationships. So if you pay attention to the right side of the screen here, on the x-axis is the child reported feelings of security with their families. Um, mind you, these are adoptive families here. Um, and the more security children report feeling, the lower their internalizing problems, or in other words, the lower their anxiety and depression. So in my last few minutes, I'll just share with you the newest direction uh, of our lab. We've been looking at our data and looking at it in the larger context of the literature on amygdala medial PFC neurobiology. And this neurobiology comes up a lot in the literature, which many of you are uh, aware of. So it comes up a lot in emotion regulation neurobiology in the adult literature. This neurobiology is also modulated by parental cues as I've discussed today. It's also altered by early caregiving adversity and it comes up in many other um, behavioral domains as well. And there was a very nice um, uh, paper written by Roy and colleagues that present a conceptual synthesis of this neurobiology, suggesting perhaps this neurobiology serves a larger function of representing semantic level affective knowledge. So um, we've been interested in this idea and moving it forward in the context of attachment behaviors to start to ask, Rather than just thinking about this neurobiology as playing a role in a process like regulating, we can ask the next question of how is it regulating or is there actually some content knowledge that's represented in this neurobiology?
And so we can start to ask, well, if so, how does this knowledge get built? So I will uh, first use an example from cognition to explain myself and then bring us back to emotion. So <laughs> according to cognitive theory, when we have memories uh, for discrete episodes, they're initially encoded by hippocampus. So for example, the first time that I meet Dr. X, I might encode, um, well, Dr. X plus Dr. X had really good insights and was very kind to that student. So those episodic memories may be encoded by the hippocampus. But with time and repetition of meeting Dr. X, those memories can become abstracted or semanticized and decontextualized. And that process um, is abstracted into these midline structures, including medial prefrontal cortex, as well as PCC. So the memory representation is transformed into a more schematic version in cortex. So for example, over time, the, the knowledge that I develop is Dr. X is brilliant and compassionate. So we've been recently wondering if something similar might happen in affective systems. So the amygdala, which also encodes episodic memories, albeit affective and non-declarative in nature may similarly be part of a process that underlies uh, development of affective schemas, such that what's initially learned at the level of the amygdala may over time become abstracted or semanticized to these cortical regions. And our hypothesis is that the development of amygdala cortical function reflects non-declarative affective semantic memory structures getting us closer to what Bulby talked about as internal working models. So in our affective example, perhaps a young infant <laughs> associates, I have a need with my need was met. And over time, this information becomes abstracted into when I have needs, they are met. So that is these early learning patterns help us make meaning out of our experiences and future experiences and also make predictions about uh, future socio-emotional encounters. So we're eager to ask, can we interrogate the content of these affective schematic memories? So this is the work of my graduate student, Anna Venucci, in collaboration with Simona Getty. And we are trying to interrogate the contents of these schemas using an attachment false memory task. Very briefly, we present to children these narratives um, that look like this. Mother and child are playing together, um, they play together. At some point, the child makes a bid of a, uh, for mother's attention. And then there's an ambiguous ending. So we play lots and lots of these narratives to children. And then later we give them a memory test and we ask them, um, what did they see? Well, there's a missing scene here. They don't act, they didn't actually see a really important event. So we give them lots of false answers. And um, the two that I want to focus in on are one of the false answers is a secure scene where the mother picks up the child. The other is a false scene that's insecure. The mother scolds the child for crying. And so we uh, looked at how children falsely reported what they saw as a function of their early pre-exposures. And I'm going to show you averages on the right representing children incorrectly inserting a secure scene into the narrative. And bars on the left are going to be children incorrectly inserting an insecure scene. So there was no difference in falsely inserting a secure scene between the children with and without a history of crees. But there was an increased tendency of falsely inserting an insecure scene for children with a crease history, suggesting to us that truly the content of the affective knowledge, not anything that children can explicitly articulate, but the way that it informs their interpretation of uh, events in their environment may be altered by these different caregiving histories. So in summary, what we think is happening is here's age on the x-axis. Parents may be particularly effective contexts in amplifying or attenuating these fear learning systems in childhood. 
it's not that parents are the only stimuli or the only context, but they're certainly very important. Um, and parents may be helping to maintain some kind of affective homeostasis during development. And we have some ideas about pathways that are turned on or turned off by parent availability or parent distress or regulation. Um, many of those are probably wrong, but um, the idea is that what's happening during this period is critical because it gives rise to the individual differences in um, emotion regulation later on in adulthood. And so perhaps we can start to start to think of parents as having some sort of privileged um, access to these deep limbic learning systems. So to conclude, we see that human amygdala cortical circuitry develops very slowly, but that there's value to this slow pace. And we see the transition to adult-like phenotypes emerging during adolescence. This therefore gives us very long sensitive periods as humans for environment uh, influencing amygdala cortical connections. And parents may be a primary source of social regulation over this neurobiology. And one of the areas we're really excited about is thinking about developing amygdala cortical circuitry as part of a neural basis for our attachment <coughs> related schemas. <laughs> Excuse me. I think I got too excited about it. So maybe these attachment related schemas are one way to think about these emotion regulation behaviors that we see in adulthood. And Crees may increase the risk for altered amygdala cortical development and attachment schemas, but there are large individual differences, including adaptations and accelerations. And finally, Strong parent-child relationships are always important, um, but they may be especially important in the wake of uh, earlier adversity. So with that, I will acknowledge my funding sources, thank the lab members and the families and individuals that participated in these studies, and thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hello. Thank you very, very much for this awesome talk. Here are already some clapping signs on the audience. I think this was very, very great. Great, and you have, you presented research and that I find immensely creative. Actually, that's, that's awesome to see this kind of uh, paradigms that you apply and very interesting. Um, so right now there's the chance to take questions from the audience. There's already one in the chat reading, um, could we say that in humans, the stress hyper-responsive period exists? Could we be the locus curirilus by mediating the specificity of sensitive periods? It's a great question and one that um, I've seen the literature go back and forth on. Um, so uh, Megan Gunner, who was my grad student advisor, has um, uh, certainly produced evidence of what looks like hyper-responsivity in infancy. Um, and so in other words, when, uh, when infants are receiving inoculations, um, vaccinations, they seem to, there seems to be this period in the first year of life when parental presence is really effective in uh, buffering stress responses. Um, it's unclear if it's parental presence that's doing this or if there truly is a hyper-responsive period. If the rodent uh, data can be a guide, um, I would say that there is a hyper-responsive period. The question is, when is it happening? Is it happening prenatally? Is it happening postnatally? Or, and or is that postnatal hyper-responsivity a reflection of the parental buffering? Um, so I would say that by my read, the jury is still out on when that hyper-responsive period occurs. Mm -hmm. Oh, and can the locus aurelius be mediating the plasticity of the sensitive periods? That is a great question and one that we're really interested in right now. Um, and we're getting at it from the angle of arousal and thinking about arousal systems. Um, so uh, we are keen on arousal for a number of reasons. One is it's one of the earliest emotions um, to emerge postnatally. 
And arousal itself, while not being a valence, is certainly uh, gives us the capacity to express a valence. And I think that a lot of the um, transition from one sensitive period to another is mediated by arousal systems like locus ceruleus. And perhaps that's part of the reason why stress early in life may be shifting the onset, uh, if that is what stress is doing, of these sensitive periods. So I, I think that's a really great question. Mm -hmm. There are several other questions in the chat. So um, do you have any idea of the influences of other caregivers other than parents, um, for example, secondary caregivers? Yeah, this is a question that is near and dear to our hearts as well. In the studies that I discussed today, we used a very blunt instrument of parent versus stranger, and that was just to identify whether there's any merit in even asking this question about parents. And we do see a big difference, perhaps not surprisingly, between parents and strangers. But this begs the question of other caregivers. So we have a study um, that manipulated the parents' presence um, but the contrast was a familiar teacher in preschool aged children. And there, uh, what we see is uh, parents still matter. Parents are still trumping the teacher, but the contrast is somewhat attenuated, suggesting that teachers can be effective um, buffers of young children's uh, affect. But uh, we still think that uh, the attachment figure is uh, still doing something over and above what a, a very uh, um, warm relationship is with a teacher. Now, a related question that we're interested in is, what about um, families that have um, an extended parenting structure? So for example, my children were raised uh, with three primary caregivers, myself, my husband, and my mother. So um, one idea that we're playing with is that the, the attachment representation that we think is being established in that medial prefrontal cortex can be established through interactions with one person, or it can be established with uh, multiple people. And what gets established is not a person, but a sense of the caregiving environment and that that is what's building up this internal working model. And so, um, so the idea is that this neurobiology or these representations actually have much more flexibility depending on the nature of the caregiving environment, which seems to suit human experience because there's so many different ways that humans raise their young. Um, and in fact, it's been argued that the reason that, for example, we have people living so long as humans is because being a grandparent played such an, a critical role in the survival of offspring. Can I start? Um, the next question would be, was there also a comparison with behavior and the presence of non-caregivers at all, but either peers or older presence trauma or stress? So I think this is a related question. Um, great question. Um, so we did not, in the presence of non-caregivers at all, but either. Person. So we did not compare um, with peers. We, we did that teacher experiment that I just described. Um, I, I will say that in uh, Megan Gunner's work, she's looked at parental buffering of uh, cortisol. And uh, while she has shown that parents can buffer cortisol of their children um, in preparation for the Trier social stress test, which is a, an excellent way to stress out humans, right, is to have them give a public talk. Um, so children's court will be buffered by their parents' presence. In the same paradigm, she found that peers did not exert the same buffering. Now, that may be because of the nature of the stress, that it was an evaluative stress. Maybe you would get buffering in another, another uh, type of stressor. That being said, I'm really fascinated with the idea that over the course of development, we sort of pass the baton to the next potential relationship 
that can serve a buffering role. So if we think about the work of Naomi Eisenberger at UCLA, she has shown that in adulthood, mm -hmm. your romantic partner can uh, serve a buffering role over a lot of the same neurobiology. And um, one, one question that emerges from observing like our findings to Naomi's is, would you, is the parent uh, child, is the parent buffering effect a developmental prerequisite for Naomi's effects? Mm -hmm. So if you didn't have that buffering effect early on, would you as an adult still get the buffering effect from a romantic partner? Or is there some type of hierarchical relationship? So um, we've been thinking a lot about these schematic affective semantic memories and how do they change over the course of development? Do we have one schema that I apply to everybody? Do I develop multiple schemas? And I have an if then clause um, depending on the context. Or the idea that I'm most keen on is that we have this sort of hierarchical arrangement of these different schemas. So we have our initial schemas based on our earliest relationships. That, and then as our relationships become more sophisticated and perhaps a little more separated from our most intimate selves, um, those uh, later schemas that we apply to friends and romantic partners may uh, be contingent on the nature of that initial relationship schema. Yeah, interestingly, we had a talk uh, from Pascal Virchika before, a year ago, and he actually talked about adolescence as a special window in, um, in attachment and also discussed this kind of peer effect on attachment related cues and I think it was the opposite that they were more insecure and that they relied a bit more on the peers and um, yeah there was some kind of shift so he has a paper latest paper on that where he also assessed fMRI data and also the Eisenberg paradigm mm -hmm. so that perfectly adds to that um, another question from the chat do you have a difference for the critical window in development between males and females? It's a great question. Um, we do not, and unfortunately our, our studies aren't statistically powered to adequately address that. Um, if I had to take a guess, uh, um, perhaps this is your guess as well, I would think that girls may show an earlier sensitive period slightly on average. And the basis of that guess is um, in terms of a number of developmental systems, as we know, girls tend to show earlier onsets. Um, but even in terms of uh, something as uh, like amygdala volumetric growth, girls tend to show a slightly earlier um, uh, emergence, and that's the work of Elizabeth Sowell. So, so I don't know the answer based off of our work, but that would be my hypothesis. Next question, have you studied the difference between good and bad relationships with parents during childhood, like, for example, parental aggression? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, it's certainly a question that we're ultimately very interested in. We have paid less attention so far to individual differences in parenting behaviors, not because they're not important, but because so much of the literature on parenting through my read has focused on those individual differences, but perhaps um, in a way not addressed the more fundamental function of what good is a parent. I mean, that, that question is really kind of what's driven a lot of our work. Mm -hmm. um, what good is a parent in general, regardless of the quality of the relationship. That being said, we think quality is really important beyond a certain good enough parenting window, right? Like I, I do subscribe to good enough parenting um, as, as being an important range, but certainly there are experiences beyond that range. And in collaboration with um, Mary Dozier, who is at the University of Delaware, and she has developed 
um, a, I think a very important intervention called ABC. It's the attachment and biobehavioral catch-up mm -hmm. um, study. It's actually a randomized control trial that she's run now twice, um, presenting an intervention to the parent early in the infant's life. These are at-risk families, at-risk for maltreatment. And what she's shown repeatedly is the intervention is going to the parent. In other words, the infant is never touched, right? It's just going to the parent to, foc to refocus their parenting strategy. And year throughout years of the child's life, she's shown that uh, a, a causal effect of this intervention on children's emotional development, their executive function, their cortisol. And um, more recently, we have uh, been able to collect imaging data and we show that um, we get these differences in amygdala prefrontal and PCC activations um, as a function of this early intervention. Now that work um, shows that attachment re related behaviors are um, more likely to be atypical in the control arm, those who didn't get the intervention. And one is more likely to see what's called disorganized attachment patterns, um, which are the, the most clinically worrying types of attachments. And that's been in, a, in one single paper been paralleled by a rodent model of this adverse or at risk um, type of parenting. Um, and so to answer your question, we do think that really adverse parenting is going to interfere with this development in the same way that I described the crease would. Um, but in, in terms of being able to look more closely at individual differences in the studies that I presented today, we, we have not done that yet. Danny Duarte says, also, I'm very curious about what is your explanation about this great inter-individual variability in response to crease? By the way, also work and talk. <laughs> Thank you, Eduardo. Um, yeah, so the individual differences is really the name of the game. I mean, we know, so it, there's a paradox in a way. We know that early childhood adversities are the number one risk factor for the number one environmental risk factor for mental health problems around the globe. So um, we know from epidemiologic studies that uh, childhood adversities account for, let me put it this way, if we could eradicate the world of childhood adversities, we would get rid of at least 30% of mental illness around the globe. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it's like really, really, significant risk factor. And yet on the other hand, the paradox is um, that there are huge individual differences and many individuals, despite experiencing these, um, these events are thriving um, or, or don't show impairment um, in cognitive or affective domains. So, um, so we're, we're very, interested in that for a number of reasons. And one study that I didn't present on today, but we just finished data collection on this last month was a six year long study that is specifically focused on heterogeneity and outcomes and trying to better understand what are the, um, what are the risk <clears throat> adverse experiences? What are the later ameliorative, potentially ameliorative events um, in, in individuals' lives? Um, and we're just at the early stages of analyzing these data. But <clears throat> if I had to put my money on something, I would say that um, the, the strength of subsequent family relationships is probably the thing that we should be really focusing on. Obviously, there's a number of other um, uh, important in events uh, that promote growth for individuals who experience early adversity. But I think that the family, depending on the age that you're you're talking about, I think the family is is probably the way to go. And um, yeah, so so that's that's where we're at. The next question is: Which mechanisms could be behind the power of caregivers to have a such powerful influence? Oh, attachment researchers would extremely cry attachment. <laughs> um, so, but on a molecular level, so there we go. Yeah. 
other ones or molecules? What's your view? So great question. Um, so I can only take my cues from the rodent literature, which obviously can get down to the cellular level um, and humans cannot. But um, uh, depending, I think there are multiple pathways. So I can start listing some and then talk about them um, in more depth. So um, uh, obviously, you know, people have looked at oxytocin pathways, people have looked at um, opiate pathways, people have looked at um, dopamine pathways and serotonin pathways, um, looked at cholinergic pathways. Um, so, so the list starts to become exhaustive. I do think there's specificity in there, but um, the broader answer is, I think that when we think about caregivers um, and this influence, it's it's most certainly not going to be one pathway because the caregiver, I'm, I'm thinking about the early work of Myron Hofer, who showed in rodent models that the caregiver isn't doing one thing, but the caregiver is this mega regulator of the infant's homeostasis. So they're regulating hunger, they're regulating temperature, they're regulating um, emotions, uh, they're regulating attention of their offspring. So we can really think about the caregiver as being this extended brain for the infant in a species like mammals, who have to form that, um, that interdependent state for survival. And so my view is that the infant's entire brain is being um, influenced by the caregiver. And that's why when you take away the caregiver, the entire system becomes dysregulated. Um, and over, you know, over short periods, of time, that's fine. That's probably actually a good thing because it helps tone uh, the system. But in a chronic state, um, that's where I think we increase the risk for psychopathology. Um, but to more directly answer your question, I turn to the work of Regina Sullivan, who has shown that the caregiver, one of the things that the caregiver is doing is that the mother in this case is she's preventing dopamine release in the amygdala. And that uh, prevention is happening by way of um, uh, cort and uh, paraventricular nucleus. Um, and uh, that process in silencing the amygdala allows for, it's the rodent and we're talking about olfactory cues, but silencing the amygdala allows for um, piriform cortex to mediate learning. And when piriform cortex is mediating learning, this is an odor-based learning, you get that preference behavior, that approach behavior that I showed. Mm -hmm. Okay, then there's also another uh, Florence is saying, thank you for this very interesting talk with some thank you notes. Um, if there are no more questions, I would say that we wrap it up here with the official part of the seminar and we pass on to the students discussion and I would encourage every student um, to stay online and we're going to pass to this next um, to this next phase of the seminar um, and that of course everyone is invited um, to stay but um, if you're not then the, the official part is over so to say <laughs> thank you very much for this talk thank you may we take a one minute break yes of course <laughs> yeah for sure i stop the recording and let people leave <laughs> thank you